And then you, you have a question. Yeah, is, is, G, is G a... Okay, it's a vector. Okay. It's a, so it's a vector for, for a ground one. Okay. This is a index for the thing. Uh, if you are implementing this, you don't keep track of the all the these. You just have one thing that you update in the end. Um, so yeah, you have this uh, important, and you proceed in rounds. How many rounds to proceed is a hyperparameter. So that's the hyperparameter p. So you run this for t rounds. At each round, first you find a classifier whose weighted uh, error is better than chance. What that means is uh, you call your weak learner, and that's what your weak learner gives you. It gives you a, a model whose uh, uh, error is better than chance. Now, once you have that, you have a classifier. You have a classifier, let's call that H sub P. H, in the end, each weak classifier is going to get a vote. So we need to compute the vote that this particular classifier gets. And the last lecture, we, we looked at the details of this a bit. Um, not going to get into the details, but uh, every classifier gets a vote. Alpha T computed this way. So half log of 1 minus the error divided by the error. And uh, if, er if the error is always better than half, meaning it is uh, less than half, that means this quantity will always be positive. So we know that alpha is a positive number. And then you update the values of the importances or the weights on the training examples. The way you do it is every example that was correctly classified by H sub t in this round, you demote it. You say, OK, I got this right. Let me make this less important. Every example that was incorrectly classified gets promoted. And the promotion and demotion for examples is multiplicate. So you have the original importances, you multiply by a factor that is either positive or sorry, either greater than one or less than one, depending on whether the uh, weak learner was correct or not. So that thing in the box is either minus one or plus one, depending on uh, whether the decision was right. So now you have uh, a set of weights for each example, the one to Sorry, uh, t plus 1. And uh, we can go to the next round. You keep doing this till you have basically run out of patience or till the hyperparameter p is uh, big enough. And then you construct the final hypothesis. The final hypothesis, H final, is a linear combination of all the classifiers. Um, a really nice way to interpret this is in the end, when a new example comes in, all your weak classifiers make a prediction. That's your HT of X. The final decision is a weighted sum of all their decisions. In fact, the, uh, but it's not a weighted, it's not an, a, a, every HT does not get an equal vote. The classifiers that were more correct, meaning the epsilon T was small, gets a larger vote because of the way the alpha is defined. So classifiers that are more correct get a larger vote in the final ensemble. OK? So this was the, this is the mechanics of the R. Uh, any questions about it? Any questions about the, this is the mechanics of this. <coughs> Imagine yourself implementing this and ask, uh, think about what you need to go wrong. Yeah. So do you, Make a prediction for each example or for every example? Like, is this done online learning or batch? Does that make sense? Um, are you asking about what happens inside step one? Yeah. Is one. Down on dt, dt plus one, you have h of t of x of i. So I wonder, is that just? Oh, it's every example. For the i example, you have that. So you make, so you use your classifier to make a prediction for each individual example. Yes. Not for all. Yes. Yes. It is a batch example. It is a batch learning algorithm. The other thing is that the thing is the step one there, we don't know what it does. I mean, we don't care. All we care about is that it it should produce a classifier whose error is better than chance, less than half. Yeah. It could be a batch learner. It could be you know 
just a random choice as if we uh, knew that something about the uh, system. Um, this whole uh, algorithm is agnostic to what happens inside the wheel lump. It could be a batch algorithm there too. Other questions? Yes. Um, so if H, if we have a particular uh, classifier that keeps learning the same features, then this boosting doesn't really help us, right? Let's uh, let me try to reinterpret the first uh, the question. If you have in step one, if H T is literally the same model, every time you call the weak uh, learner, you get back the same classifier again and again. What happens then is so let's let's uh, work it out. Let's say you get the weak classifier and uh, you make a prediction. And then at this step, the mistakes get promoted, the correct answer labels get demoted. At that point, you're uh, uh, you're changing the distribution of the data. Let's say you get back the same classifier again. That means the mistakes didn't get uh, promoted enough. Either that, or at that point, there's not enough signal left in the data. You keep getting back the same uh, model. Eventually, one or two things will happen or should happen. You should get a new classifier, or at that point, there's not enough signal for you to kind of uh, using the hypothesis based on the A sum. Yeah? This one? This is just e power. This is just a, another way of writing e power minus. Yeah, you, you see this notation sometimes because uh, that can be, uh, you know, that, that you have a superscript with subscripts and it just looks ugly. Yes. I'm having a hard time saying how step two, subset three affects the final hypothesis. This one here? Yeah. Ah, so the <laughs> connection is here. The we, what we are there are two places where the connection shows up. Remember, actually, there's, there are two connections. One one is there, and the other one is here. So let me just go through that. The first one is. D at any time, DT determines which weak classifier to pick. You want to find a weak learner whose weighted error is better than chance. Not error, but weighted error, weighted by D. So, you're, in some sense, you can't just use any of the learning algorithms we saw as is. You need to modify them you know, such that they respect the current weight. <coughs> so, an example that is that has a high weight should be treated as more important by the learning algorithm. An example that has low weight can be ignored. So that's one place where it affects it. The second place, remember the definition of the error. Epsilon t is not just how many mistakes, what fraction of mistakes. It is the sum of the weight for all the examples where the current weak learner made a mistake. So alpha t intimately depends on gt. So both alpha t depends on, there are two places, both step 1 and step 2 depend on dt. Step 1 depends on dt because we want to find a classifier whose weighted error is, weighted error is less than chance, better than chance. The second one is the definition of error itself has changed. As a result, alpha t changes. Uh, we went over the details of the, that in the last lecture, so I don't want to write down the math again, but uh, we can take that offline too. So, what I have told you so far is just the mechanics of the algorithm. And uh, just to illustrate this for the last thing, uh, using the example that we saw last week, we have three classifiers. Our uh, weak uh, hypothesis phase was just vertical lines or horizontal lines. And our goal was to separate out the process and the minuses. Every, um, let's say we ran this for three rounds. Um, we have three classifiers, H1, H2, and H3. And each of them has a weight, and the final decision is taken by uh, taking the decision of each of these h i's and taking the sign of that, and uh, taking the sign of the weighted uh, um, decision. Now, what is 
important to realize is implicit inside all this is we don't care about any of the HRs. All we care about at the end is the H1 that we construct. And we could ask, what is the hypothesis space or the actual classifier that we are going to return? Each of these is either a vertical line or a horizontal line. What is interesting is by taking the linear combination of them, you could get a classifier that is not in the hypothesis space that we consider because you are essentially merging these three things. So you could get a classifier that is more complex than the hypothesis space that we actually consider. And this is important. Running Adobe's for many, many iterations can allow you to kind of essentially put circles around just a positive example. If, if there was a minus here, Adobe's would probably do something like this. And it will find another one of these that goes into the negative. And you can essentially just keep drawing boxes around each positive example if necessary. And that is important because the final hypothesis of Adaboost is not in the original hypothesis space that we consider because we are taking a combination of many of them. Questions? This should raise some alarm or ring some alarm. Imagine that we had a data set that was and we restrict ourselves only to access parallel lines. Adipose will still find the right classifier because what it will do is it will draw a line here and say everything is positive. It will draw a line here and say this side is positive. Something here and this is positive. Something here and this is positive. And only uh, the region in the middle was not as negative. What could go wrong with this? Yeah? You could overfit. In fact, we will keep the worry of overfitting in mind. If you run Adaboost long enough, you could overfit any training set, any training set. And now suddenly it doesn't look that good anymore. That, that's what the theorem says. The theorem for Adaboost is something like this. <coughs> First of all, the theorem is an analysis of the training. What it says is, let's say you run Adaboost for T rounds. T is a hyperparameter. And when you run Adaboost for T rounds, let's say every weak classifier has an error epsilon T, which is better than chance, which is slightly less than half. It's less than half by gamma T. So you have this is 0, this is 1, this is half, this is your error, epsilon t, and this gap here is gamma t, which is slightly less than half. Let's say that gamma is the smallest of all the gamma t's. What the theorem says is after running Adaboost for t rounds, the training error of the final hypothesis is going to be less than e power t, e power minus t, times gamma square. Now, as t, capital T increases, the number of rounds increases, what this means is that training error exponentially drops. That is, it, it drops rather fast. Okay. Just to walk through this again, you have a weak learner. As t increases, the training error <coughs> drops drastically. This is actually a rather simple theorem to prove. Uh, it is mathematically, it, it's a bit involved in terms of the algebra, but it's actually fairly simple. And there's a proof on the, there's a link to the proof on the class website. If you're interested, you should take a look. And the proof will explain why uh, all these choices of alpha and epsilon make sense. Yes. Uh, down below in this, uh, in this proof for uh, the gamma squares. Yes. Is that uh, is that uh, all the gamma gammas combined, or is that? It's the smallest of all the gammas. All the smallest. It's, it's, the, it's the smallest of all the gamma. <laughs> it's as good as the best weak learn. Okay. So think of what gamma does. Uh, so uh, this is why I, I actually 
mentally I visualize it this way. So, so let's say this is half and this is gamma. If gamma is small, if gamma is large, sorry, uh, let me just read, uh, I, I misstated, but let's draw work it out. If gamma is large, that means your classifier is good because the error is what is left behind. The error is this part here. If gamma is large, the classifier is good. If gamma is small, that means it's the worst weak learn. So the train, the bound is controlled by the worst of your weak learn. Yeah. So this strategy of uh, uh, dating the exam. So there seems to be a lot of cases where dating the examples could be using a weak learner. So one could be maybe you have a noisy training data where you could wait the example. Yes. So could you could you give us some other applications where this strategy would be? So in general actually the idea of waiting examples is a good thing to keep in mind. So this is an idea this idea is called cost sensitive learning. Cost sensitive learning is where every training example comes with a cost and the cost is how much should you pay if you make a mistake on this example. Uh, this often becomes useful when uh, say we are trying to, when, when there is a domain specific, uh, when there is domain dependent information on certain situation. It shows up often, uh, one place where it shows up could be in medical cases where let's say I have a, I'm training a classifier for some diagnostic purpose, to help with some diagnostic purpose. If the classifier makes a mistake on uh, a patient who is sick, uh, the cost is much higher because of some reason. Let's say the patient is, uh, uh, it could lead to very adverse situation. Uh, and so you, you want to uh, penalize mistakes of that kind more. So that strategy is very useful. Cost sensitive learning is a general um, extension to a lot of learning algorithms. And when we finish or when we come to the end of support vector machines, uh, you'll observe that there's a very easy extension to many, many learning algorithms to make them cost sensitive. By just adding, we've already encountered one uh, such case where we saw linear regression. The way we framed linear regression was for every example, we had a, a loss. All you have to do is just multiply the loss by the cost when you add up the total cost. So that's the, the that's the general strategy for cost sensitive learning, but it shows up in other places. Well, let's say you have a, a classification task where certain labels are important. Um, the most recent example that I had to do this was uh, um, some a paper that one of my students wrote where we are predicting um, let's say how well a, a therapy dialogue is going, a, a dialogue in psychotherapy. If the therapist says certain things, it's really bad. And we really want to recognize that because any good therapist should never say that. So a classifier that's predict is trained to uh, predict these properties should focus on those things. And if it makes a mistake on that, that's bad. So we increase the cost of those uh, labels. So cost sensitive learning is often accompanied, is often introduced into um, um, uh, applications by not assigning a cost for every example, but by assigning a cost for every label, because that's more manageable. If you have a million examples and 10 labels, it's easier to assign a cost for each label than each example. Boosting at a boost does a rather fancy thing where it manipulates the costs or manipulates the uh, Waits for each example, but that's just that's why it's no. Yeah, but Atlas has a problem because it's always going to assign a very high weight to noisy example. That's right. Adaboost has a problem because it is yes, you're right. It will assign high weight <coughs> eventually. It will keep assigning. It will keep promoting those examples that are noisy. Um, as a result, the cost of noisy examples keeps getting higher, and eventually. It will find a weak classifier that gets that one example right. As a result, it will overfit. Just like with decision trees, if you run it long enough, it will overfit. Or will it? And that's where we should uh, look at some results. <coughs> so, the question to think about 
is, is it enough to just bound training error? The theorem says training error will go down. Eventually, it will go down so low that all examples in the training set will be correctly classified, which means it will be zero. Everything we know from the theory of machine learning says this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you get zero training error because it's not going to tell us about generalization. What you see is uh, if you um, run Adaboost long enough, eventually training error will training error will actually go down to zero. Um, and that seems like a problem until you. Oh, by the way. Uh, also, you, uh, what often tends to happen, not always, but often tends to happen is individual weak classifiers tend to get worse. Uh, this is just an empirical observation. There's no reason this should happen. However, the thing that really matters is the test error or generalization error. <coughs> what, the, what learning theory tells us is, uh, or sorry, what the theory of Hadamus tells us is that the training error goes down. It will exponentially keep decreasing and eventually hit zero. But what we also noticed is as we run Adamus longer and longer, the edge final keeps getting more and more complex. What learning theory tells us is if your classifier gets more complex, it will overfit. As a result, one might expect that if you keep running Adamus, the generalization error goes up. So there's some sweet spot where we should stop, which is actually true. You, the number of uh, the iterations p is something you need to keep track of. That's what you expect from the theory. Except in practice, something really weird happens. The blue curve is training error, and this is the test error. And even though training error keeps going down or goes to zero, test error does not go up. It doesn't seem to get worse, even though things are getting at least visibly more complex. The test, in fact, in some cases, I don't think it shows up here, in some cases, the test error goes down even after training error goes to zero. And uh, this was a nice little puzzle for a lot of the, uh, for the people who were working in this field. And there were a couple of interesting papers written uh, from the late 90s that tried to explain this. There were at least two or three different explanations. And the one that I like the most is uh, from this paper, uh, which involves uh, Schaeffer, Freund, Bartlett, and Lee, which talks about how, yeah, sure, even though the complexity of the model seems to increase, actually, uh, one thing that also increases as you run at a boost longer and longer is that the margin of the linear classifiers. Remember that at a boost is a linear combination of the thing and the margin keeps increasing. Um, so there's some connections to maximizing margins that shows up with at a boost. You should read the paper if you are interested. It's actually a uh, kind of fun uh, paper to read and uh, think about. Any thoughts? Any questions? Yes. In my math is wrong, but as a training error goes to zero, does not alpha also go to zero? So the most of the illustrated model don't count. As the training error goes to zero, the percentage of alpha is one less a lot of oh, 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 this is not the training error of that thing. This is the training error of H final. So it's possible that, oh, this is the reason. Alpha <laughs> depends on epsilon t, right? Alpha is only a function of epsilon t. So I found that epsilon, so let's see, alpha t is half log 1 minus epsilon t divided by epsilon t. Alpha t will be 0 when this quantity is 0. But that quantity will be 0 when the numerator and the denominator are equal, which means when epsilon t is half. So alpha t will be 0 only when the weak classifier is truly random. But this plot here is about the training error of H final, not of any of the weak classifiers. So alpha t will stop. So essentially, alpha t will uh, need not be zero, even though H final goes to zero. 
the training error of the final classifier is zero, not any of the weak ones. So when boosting truly becomes useless is when the weak classifier starts getting you, a, uh, the weak learner starts giving you a classifier whose error is exactly half or actually worse than half at which point the alphas will be negative. So that's like an upper bound at which point we should not run boosting anymore. Until then, the alphas will still be non -trained. Does that? Other questions? Okay, so just to quickly summarize what add a boost is and uh, move to general ensembles. Add a boost is a rather simple thing to implement. Actually, uh, the only minor tweak that you need to do is you need to change all your learning algorithms to account for cost sensitive uh, learning. No matter what learning algorithm you use, its hyperparameters still show up. You still need to find its best hyperparameter. There is one more hyperparameter you need to worry about, which is capital T, the number of rounds you run this thing. You can use it with any weak learner, and uh, uh, you know you don't need to think too hard about the weak learner that you're using. In fact, you can use lousy uh, weak classifier and still boosting uh, helps. Um, you should be careful about overfitting and underfitting here. If the weak learners are too complex, in other words, if the weak learners are strong, then add boost tends to overfit. This was a question that came up last week or in the last day. If the weak learners are too weak, then you might have to run this thing for too many iterations. So you may underfit. It may not be expressive enough. Even H final may not be under uh, may not be expressive enough. Uh, perhaps the crowning moment of Adobe's life came when uh, came in the mid 2000s uh, with this paper from Rich Caruana and his student, um, who showed that who ran this uh, for 2006 extensive experiments uh, on many 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 different data sets and many, many different learning algorithms and found that boosted decision stumps, you know decision stumps, you know boosting, so you can actually do boosted decision stumps. Boosted decision stumps in 2006 were the best thing to do if you had a small number of teachers. And by small, they meant about 300 teachers. <clears throat> um, no other learning algorithm came close to it at that time. We are more than a decade away from that, so things have changed a bit. But boosted decision stumps are still an excellent, excellent general purpose uh, uh, learning algorithm because they bring in the best of ensembling and uh, theory and all that. Speaking of ensembling, let's uh, 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 abstract out the discussion to other ensemble methods. Particularly look at uh, two more, bagging and random forest, and there's a chance that you'll see one more in your next homework. Uh, in general, you can think of ensembling as meta learning algorithms that use another learning algorithm to build a committee of classifiers and somehow combine their predictions to make a single one. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is like the idea of the wisdom of crowds. If you have many, many uh, individual decisions, their mistakes average out and their uh, decisions are more correct. Uh, there's a nice uh, story involving the weight of a cow in, I think, 1900 or so. Um, there's an interesting short paper by Francis Galton about that, if you want to read about the list of crowds. Anyway, um, ensembles tend to be empirically robust because errors tend to average out. And they tend to be very, very heavily used in applications. Um, there was a, uh, in 2008 and 9, anyone who was doing uh, machine learning, at least in grad school, was uh, uh, excited by the idea of winning a million dollars from Netflix if you beat their in-house recommendation system. So they released a data set and they uh, asked the community to build a classifier or a system. It was, uh, uh, let's not worry about the details, but they wanted you to build a system that can recommend movies better than what they could. Um, it was telling that the team that won the challenge, the million dollars, was called the ensembles. It was actually a committee of a com bunch of committees of classifiers. And that's how they were able to, well, you know, they, 
It also meant, meant that the million dollars had to be split among a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, that's a nice story. We've seen boosting. Boosting is an example of an ensemble method. Uh, what you do is you weight all training examples equally in the beginning, and then you train more, you know, you train models <coughs> on weighted data sets, and you reweight the examples at every iteration. You can typically uh, need about a few hundred uh, of uh, iterations of uh, weak learners to make this work. And Adaboost is every step of this ensembling process in Adaboost is carefully orchestrated. It's not that you can reweight the examples arbitrarily, you need to reweight it as defined by the recipe. It's not that you can combine the weak classifiers in any way you want, you need to do it as defined by the recipe. So there's a careful weighted prediction of each one. There are multiple different perspectives on Adaboost, and uh, that's what I was talking about. With the, you know, one could argue that, or uh, Shapir and others uh, argued that boosting um, messes around with the margin of the classifiers. We'll talk about max margin classifiers right after this, um, and that's why it works. Um, statisticians, uh, Friedman and <coughs> Shirani. They said that it's actually uh, very similar to logistic regression, which we'll see much later. Um, one way or another, boosting has multiple views of why it works, uh, but it's a linear classifier. It's a linear classifier over the weak learners, over the weak classifiers. It's a linear classifier over the weak classifiers. So one way of thinking about it is each weak classifier is really a feature that you are learning. And then you are combining all those, so you are not learning a feature, you are not learning a classifier in one shot, you are learning a classifier and you are also learning what features you to use. So it is an example of uh, representation learning, but it was not really pitched that way. Let's, yes? It, can, can we mix uh, like classifiers for example, like a, uh, like a decision tree with the perceptron? You can. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, all you need, remember, all you need is a weak decision system that is better than chance. Adaboost does not look inside what the decision engine is. It could be a mixture of things. Um, though, you should be careful with doing that. Because if your weak classifiers are too strong, you will overfit. So, an obvious thing that you should not do is your weak classifier should not be another instance of Adaboost. So you can keep doing that all the way down. Um, but with some um, caveats, you can do what you want. Okay, another uh, simple <coughs> ensemble is called bagging. Bagging is short for bootstrap aggregating um, uh, from Leo Bryan. What you do is you have a training set. Uh, a fixed training set with m examples. You iteratively, you repeat multiple times uh, the following steps. You sample some number of examples, m prime number of examples, from the training set, but with replacement. Sampling with replacement means the same example can show up multiple times. So you sample a new training set with replacement, and you train any classifier you want on the sample on these samples, so you get a classifier. You do this again. When you sample again, you might get a different training set. You get another sample, you train another classifier. You keep doing this again and again, a whole number of times. Uh, I think that one of the recommendations was the number of times you do this should be the number of training examples, but really, no, you just do it a certain number of times, pick a number. And then finally, what you do is uh, you, you have done this say n times, so you have n classifiers. And they are all not they are not all the same classifier. They need not be the same classifier because you are sampling some now uh, each uh, CI is uh, trained on a different sa sample of the training set. So you have a certain number of classifiers, each of them at the end when you they have to make a prediction, each of them votes. Every Classifier CI gets just one vote. The votes are not weighted or anything. You just vote 
uh, every classifier votes on the new example and the label that gets the maximum number of votes is the winner. So you use the plurality uh, to decide the new label. <coughs> so it, it's bagging is a method for generating multiple versions of a classifier using a fixed data set. Uh, you can use this for regression, you can use this for classification. If you're doing regression, then all you have to do is take the average of all the positions. If you're doing classification, you use the most common label. It's actually rather simple to implement. In fact, uh, very often uh, this tends to be a, a embarrassingly good classifier, uh, so, yeah, an embarrassingly good method because it's not particularly heavy. It just works and uh, here's an idea for you to try out on your project. Uh, the reason it's called bagging is because uh, the way in which you construct multiple uh, these uh, sample training examples with uh, replacement is called bootstrap replication. So you do uh, bootstrap, you create multiple bootstrap replicates with the training set and you create a classifier and you aggregate the decision. So you have bootstrap aggregation. It turns out, like I said, it uh, works pretty well and it's one of these things that's always worth adding on top of anything you do. Uh, because it just works. And it's, uh, it's one of these ideas that no matter what classifier you use, just throw an ensemble in and it makes things better. Even with fancy uh, neural networks and such things which are supposed to not need any extra machinery um, in many recent papers I've noticed they have a big neural network that is really complicated and they have to explain all the whole thing and then there's a small paragraph oh by the way we have an ensemble that gives us two more points and so we do that um, so you know keep an ensemble as a tool in your toolkit as you know just adding on top. In fact, if you want to make your life easier, have general purpose code that just ensemble things. You, know, you run all your experiments and at the end when you want to sell your classifier, sell an ensemble. Um, you should be careful with the ensemble store because uh, uh, it may lead to some uh, concerns. One place where it shines is if Different perturbations of the training set with bootstrap replication can give you different classifiers. That means you have, in some sense, different experts on different views of the uh, data. Then it works. Where you should be careful is, let's say your data is extremely uh, skewed towards one label. Let's say you have a training set with um, one positive example and a million negative examples. And if you subsample from that, possible that you just get positive examples. So your classifiers might reflect the skew. And maybe you want to change the way you sound. Uh, here's a, yes. When, when, you, when you're taking your random sample, yeah. let's say you have a test set of 5,000. Yes. Is, is there a number you want to match? No. 5,000 random samples or is it like a, like a no, uh, smaller? You should, okay, so as a general rule, you should use no property of the test set when you are training your uh, model. The fact that you're, if you use the fact that your test set has 5,000 examples to train your model. I mean, I mean training set. Oh, your training set. Yeah, training okay, okay, okay. okay, so that's one possibility. You could, I mean, this is a choice that you have to uh, decide on. Uh, I've seen both things work. Um, I don't have a good um, recommendation for which one should it should not be too small. Beyond that, I have nothing uh, intelligent to add. Yes. Uh, that is a good question. What can you say about the certainty and decision of our final model based on the number of those underlying models? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. So the question was, can we say anything about the certainty of our decision based on the number of votes it gets? So it turns out now you have multiple experts predicting on this. And so you can use the disagreement between these classifiers as a measure of uncertainty. Imagine you have a hundred classifiers and say 60 of them say true and 40 of them say false. Yeah, sure, the majority label is true, but it's also close to even. 
which means you can use this idea to get a sense of how uh, confident you, your predictions are. And this is a useful thing to do. And in fact, this idea is used quite successfully for active learning. If I need to know on a new example, should this, is my system uh, aware of this example? And let's say I want to know whether I should send this example out to an expert, a human, for labeling or not. You can use bootstrap replicate um, to get an uncertainty measure on that example. And if the uncertainty is high, then you actually get a human label. So confidence estimates can be obtained from um, uh, this sort of ensemble idea. Not just this, but actually any ensemble. So here's a cartoon example of uh, bad decision trees. And here I'm using decision trees, not as we saw before, for classification, but for regression. Simply to remind you that uh, decision trees can be used for regression. So every tree, the leaf of every tree, is going to be a real number or something that predicts a real number. So imagine you have many, many trees, T trees, and uh, you, when, uh, when a new example comes in, each tree makes a prediction and you add up all the predictions and divide by the number of trees and that could be your label. Because you have a multiple prediction, just to follow up on the previous question, you can also compute the standard deviation and things like that. So you get a sense of confidence. But if they are all, uh, if the standard deviation is small, then you can be more certain about the uh, about the label. For example, let's take uh, bagging and make it even more crazy. Call it random forest. Random forest is uh, you can think of it as bagging plus plus. What you do is you draw many bootstrap aggregates, bootstrap uh, sorry uh, replicate of the data. In at each step. In addition to just using a subsample of all the data, you also use a subsample of all the features. If you have a thousand features, you don't use all features, you just use a subsample of the features. And then you train a tree, for example. It's often a tree because uh, random forest, uh, as the name suggests, it has many trees. Um, so you train trees on um, a sample of the data and a subset of the features. And you do this many times. Yes. Um, again, the same question uh, as a number of examples. Uh, Hyperparameter, or uh, just a design choice. Yeah. One of the slides you mentioned there is a calibration problem with this uh, model. So one of the previous slides. Even just. Yeah, but ask a question. I will look for it. So, uh, so when you say you can, we do get us some sort of uncertainty from these. Are they calibrated? Yeah. Perhaps not. In fact, I would argue most likely not. Uh, I can't find the slide, but that's your answer. There is still a calibration question. You might not get a real probability. You just know that there's something uncertain about the result. So, yeah, going back to random forest, yeah, you can just uh, apply the same idea. You don't use all the features. And the intuition is maybe some features are essentially overloading uh, the tree and it always comes into, gets chosen. And maybe in the future, that feature may not show up. And so this makes your system more robust to uh, dominant features. Yes. For the, the, the bad trees, are, are they are the round forest as well? Yeah. Are, are we actually a, like a endless effect word, but uh, like discretizing the values of? Uh, you could. In fact, uh, notice that what's happening here is completely underspecified. Internal. All the question you asked is internal to this uh, process. So it could discretize them the same way, it could discretize them differently, doesn't matter. Okay. It's internal to the process of the uh, tree training. Or it could be external if you choose to have one discretization up at the top. Either way works. <clears throat> Notice that I'm not giving you any uh, 
concrete answers to many questions here because these are all design choices. These are the kinds of design choices you have to uh, deal with when uh, when the learning algorithms get more complicated. One systematic way of exploring design choices is to treat them as hyperparameters and use cross validation because then you can you don't have to worry about overfitting in uh, uh, some ways. So let me wrap up the discussion on ensembles. So we looked at boosting. We started this discussion on ensembles actually as a, an offshoot of learning theory. So add a boost came into existence as an answer to a question in learning theory, does weak learnability imply strong learnability? This was just a question and it turns out the answer was yes. And not only was the answer yes, the answer was yes with a construction. It was a constructive proof in the form of this argument, at least. Weak learnability not only implies strong learnability, weak learners can be made strong using this algorithm. You need to understand the algorithm, you need to understand how it works. Uh, you, are in, you, you should think about how you might go about implementing it and you should know um, the, the intuition behind the theorem, if not the proof. The proof I won't expect that you should know, but it's nice to know. But more generally, uh, you should know ensembles. We looked at ensembles. And this is an important idea. Ensembles are, you know, in terms of the amount of time we spend on a topic in a class, in this class versus its value in the future, ensembles is the most unfortunate in that ratio because we didn't spend too much time on ensembles because it's such an intuitive idea. But I think you'll find that ensembles are going to be like a thing that will always help you no matter which application you use simply because they are statistically more robust. So uh, think of ensembles as a tool that you use anytime you're using the, any learning algorithm. And it's now, uh, now what, what has happened is it's essentially a meta algorithm. It is a multiplier. Every learning algorithm you know, <coughs> you know that algorithm and you know an ensemble of it. Right? So you have an ensemble of perceptrons, ensemble of decision trees, ensemble of SVMs, ensemble of Decision trees and SVM. Maybe a decision tree on top of SVM. So now you have this idea of building learners on top of learners. Questions? Yeah, Sorry, I so we have half an hour left today, and I'm going to start a new topic, namely support vector machines. So we're going to look at support vector machines. I think in the time that's left, I'll probably only have the time to introduce what SVMs are and how they also came into existence as an answer to a, uh, an idea in learning theory. But uh, just to kind of step back and see where we are and what we've seen so far, we've seen decision trees, we've seen perceptron, we've seen adibus, and we've seen the general idea of ensembles. Uh, at least two of these produce linear classifiers. Um, Perceptron is a linear classifier. Adibus is also a linear classifier, except it's linear over the weak, uh, weak uh, classifiers. Uh, we looked at general principles from machine learning. Uh, overfitting is something that's important. We've looked at mistake-driven learning. We've looked at back uh, theory and uh, the idea of you know sample complexity and how to choose, how the choice of your hypothesis makes learning more or less difficult. Um, and the general idea of, uh, um, you know, the errors, <coughs> training errors or empirical errors and generalization <coughs> errors. In the next few lectures, we'll look at how uh, learning theory gives us an approach to uh, systematically define a learning algorithm by minimizing what's called loss. Specifically, we look at an instantiation of this in the context of learning linear classifiers, but the principle of empirical risk minimization is the dominant principle in uh, machine learning today. Um, pretty much most successes of machine learning today are built on top of this principle. So we will look at our vector machines and then use that as a vehicle to go towards this idea of risk minimization. Any questions about uh, where we are?
where we are and what the plan is. In terms of the learning algorithms you've seen, or the models you've seen, you've seen linear models. And we have this question of what makes a learning algorithm good? If you, we can answer this question in using online learning, and when that combines with linear models, you get algorithms like Perceptron, which we have seen, and Winnow, or its generalization, exponentiated gradient, which we have not seen, but if you are interested, I can point you to material of that. We looked at pack learning and, uh, and, it, uh, and agnostic learning and such things, and when pack learning meets linear models, we get support vector machine. But that's not the only way to answer this question. There are other things, and we will at least look at one more answer to this question of how good a learning algorithm is. And that answer will be Bayesian learning. And when Bayesian learning meets linear models, we get logistic regression. We'll see that in maybe a few weeks. So this unit is about uh, support vector machines. Um, today we'll talk about uh, how we can train classifiers by maximizing margin, and that will lead us to the SVM learning objective. Uh, most likely, in next, in next week, we'll look at uh, how we can solve the SVM optimization problem. And then I'll spend very little time on why uh, support vector machines are called support vector machines by talking about uh, uh, the notion of a dual optimization problem. I don't think we've spent too much time on kernels uh, just because we have to cut something to make way for other things. So let's uh, look at how we can train by maximizing the margin. And we have seen this before, uh, but it's always intimidating to look at it. So I'll walk through this again. Um, what we know from um, uh, the VC theory of learning is if we have M training examples, and we want to learn a classifier using a hypothesis space H, capital H is a set of functions, possibly an infinite set, it has its VC dimension. Then, with high probability, any classifier that we learn, little h, if it has a training error of error s, its generalization error will be no more than the training error plus. This term. this term here is a function of the VC dimension of the classifier and the confidence that we want, the delta. So what this gives us is a strategy for learning. We want to minimize generalization error. Our goal, I mean, that's the only thing we care about. We want to minimize generalization error. What, it, uh, what this tells us is the generalization error is bounded by the training error plus some term in, involving uh, VC dimension. Also, if you look at the term and stare at it, what you'll notice is lower VC dimension means this cut, this bound is tight. So what this says is, uh, you know, in order to train a classifier, don't just minimize its training error. Minimize the training error plus something else that forces the VC dimension to go down. Because if you minimize the sum of those two things, then you get better generalization. That's the general intuition. Another piece of information that we also know is that the VC dimension of a linear classifier in D dimensions is D plus 1. What does it mean to minimize the VC dimension of a linear classifier? It's D plus 1. I mean, if you have D features, the VC dimension is D plus 1, how could you reduce that? One possible idea is to reduce the number of features. That seems to make sense. But let's say that uh, I don't have that luxury or I don't know how to do it. How do we reduce the VC dimension of something that is that seems to be a constant? The question to think about is, are all linear classifiers in D dimensions the same? And this was a really neat insight uh, that uh, led Bapnik down this line of uh, support vector machine. Let's, uh, in order to answer that question, uh, let's go back to this uh, idea of margin that we saw when we looked at perceptron. So we have uh, positive and negative points, 
the margin is a property of a hyperplane. Given a particular hyperplane, the margin is the distance of the closest point to it. Right? We've seen this with perceptron. And with perceptron, we've noticed that when margin is large, we like the, 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 the mistake bound gets small. So larger margins are preferred. Use a similar uh, um, intuition to answer this question. Let's say you have the same data set and we need to consider whether H1 is better or H2 is better. And we also, at least from the picture, it seems H2 has a larger margin. If someone suggests reasons for why one might prefer uh, one of these classifiers, <laughs> both of them are equally correct. Both of them have zero error. Imagine what happens when we have to use this classifier in the future. And you get a new ring, new example that's not in this set. Yes? That's right. So the intuition is that so you know if a class of, if a new example comes in that's not in the training set, an example a, a hypothesis or a classifier that has a larger margin has lesser chance of making a mistake because an example was accidentally on the wrong side. Think of, uh, you know, the, it's, when I say margin, think margin of safety. We are leaving, leaving ourselves a gap of this much for positive examples or negative examples to slip in. Whereas here, the gap is only this much, so the, you know, the margin is smaller means a positive example might accidentally fall on the wrong side of the classifier. So the best we can do is to force the uh, hyperplane <coughs> to be in a place where the margin is large. Any questions about the intuition? Before we look at a theorem that tells us the same thing. Intuitively, larger margins are better. But how do we quantify this? One way of doing that is to consider linear classifiers, all linear classifiers that have a certain margin. Let's say we have two um, sets of linear classifiers, both of which perfectly classified example. H1 is a linear classifier that perfectly classifies your entire training set with margin gamma 1. H2 is another set of linear classifiers that perfectly classifies all your training examples with margin gamma 2. And let's say gamma 1 is more than gamma 2. Meaning all the classifiers in H1 have a higher margin, margin than all the classifiers in H2. That means in some intuitive sense, in the way that I described before, the entire set H1 is better. The entire set H1 will generalize better because the chances of a new example breaking into the margin is lower for H1 than H2. Now, in terms of VC dimension, this seems to be problematic because both H1 and H2 are linear classifiers in the same space. Both of them have VC dimension of D plus 1. What that means is our old definition of VC dimension, or what that could mean is our old definition of VC dimension is broken. It does not account for the fact that H1 generalizes better than H2. What we need is an extension of that VC dimension that accounts for a particular data set. We need a data dependent VC dimension, which uh, thankfully we don't have to prove it. Vaplik proved it for us. Uh, but any questions about this before we look at what Vaplik had to say? Your, yes. So if you define that, let's say the error as in 
the, the loss has to be at least uh, greater than this, uh, less than this mark. Uh, so it has to be this much confident. What is loss? We have uh, a table. Then, uh, then, uh, uh, the, so whatever example it classifies, it has to classify it in with certain confidence. What is confidence? Uh, it would be probability uh, one, one of the case is the logistic regression. We don't know what logistic regression is. So, so, uh, so let's say let's, let's look at look at linear regression. You have a, a real number. So we want always want it want it to be less than at least certain point. The, okay, the error. You want the error to be low. Is your yeah. point? Yes. So what I'm saying, uh, is it possible to enforce a confidence such that the training error is also uh, so for H1 and H2 it is it is not the same. H1 and H2, I'm assuming that both H1 and H2 perfectly classify the training error. Both right. of them have zero training error. Right. So what I'm saying, uh, can we define a training error in such a way that H1, H1 and H2 training, uh, training error for H1 and H2 are <coughs> such that it comes into the equation for... That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. We're going to define a way to quantify or uh, to... What we're going to define is a way to characterize these hypothesis spaces which look equivalent from the training error point of view and see if we can make H1 look better because it matches our intuition. That's our goal. And this is going to be aided by a theorem from Wapnick. If you have a set of uh, linear classifiers, all of which separate the training set. And let's say that uh, this set has a margin. Yeah, all the examples, all the classifiers in this set, all the linear classifiers in H, perfectly classify the entire training set with a margin gamma. Then uh, Wapnick showed that the VC dimension is less than a term that involves R square over gamma square and D. So it's the minimum of these two things. Where R is the radius of the data, the same capital R that we saw with perceptron, and gamma, it actually is the same gamma that we saw with perceptron. And R square over gamma square is exactly the same complexity term that we saw with perceptron. Um, so, what Wapnick says is sure, you have D dimensions, the VC dimension is uh, D plus 1, but uh, it's really not D plus 1. If I know that entire, the, all the uh, examples classified are classified with margin gamma, then you have to worry about R square over gamma square as well. <coughs> this says that if gamma is really small, then VC can be large. More importantly, if gamma is large, then VC can be made small. <laughs> yes. Um, so the issue that we were having earlier is we were trying to minimize the training error and the VC dimension. But Dimension is constant for linear classification. Yes. Here, we're mid, you know, now we have a new definition of the VC dimension. Mm -hmm. It's not a new it's definition. It's the same definition, but it's a bound. Okay. Um, yes. R and gamma are still constants for the data set. R is a constant. Gamma depends on the classifier. <coughs> Margin is a property of a hyperplane. But when we were talking about perceptron, you talked about how a data set has a given margin. No, that was the largest margin for the data. <coughs> this is the margin of all the classifiers in this set. So you can talk about the margin of a data set and the margin of a classifier. It's unfortunate that the same symbol gamma is used for both of them, but uh, yes. But this, this means that if gamma is large, the VC can be made small, which gives us a way to train classifiers. Find that linear classifier that perfectly separates the data and has the largest margin. And if people complain, you can ask them to talk to that. So the recipe is larger margins give you lower VC dimension, and lower VC dimensions give you better generalization. So here's a criterion for training. Make find the classifier that maximizes the margin. Or in this case, if we are talking about linear classifiers, find the linear separator that maximizes the margin. Yes. Sir. Okay, so 
So what's the intuition behind the theorem? What's the intuition behind the theorem, especially behind the R squared? Oh, so the intuition behind R squared is exactly the same as the, the, what we had for Cosetra. Um, if you, margin by itself is not a quantity that <coughs> is independent of the radius of the data. As, because you can always zoom in and out. And it might look like the margin is large. So, for example, if you have points that look like this. And it seems like the margin is really small. But what if I zoom in and suddenly the margin looks big? Because it has this distance, at least in the screen, hopefully, has become bigger. If you zoom in and out of the data, um, there is an extra degree of freedom, which is the scale of the data. And we want our bound to be independent of that. And all, another way in which the same theorem is presented is instead of saying uh, R square over gamma square, you could also say that let's suppose that all our examples lie within a unit ball. All our examples lie within a circle of size 1 of radius 1, then the same theorem would be 1 over gamma square. So this is just a normalization term that uh, makes this bound independent of the scale of the data. It's exactly the same intuition we had for R square showing up for Okay, so yes. Um, Because uh -huh. V has a very, very large margin, it would be a small number in comparison to what V is. Yes. Wouldn't that like drastically reduce the V? Yes. If you have a massive margin, the dimensionality doesn't matter anymore. If you have a very, very small margin, that's when the dimensionality kicks in. At that point, the complexity of learning depends not on the margin, but the dimensionality. <laughs> yes, because it's the minimum. So one another way of saying the same thing is if I had to plot a curve of let's say you have gamma and you have VC. If gamma is really really small, the VC will be E plus one. At some point, the dimensionality becomes irrelevant, and then VC starts starts dropping. And it drops as 1 over gamma squared. So, what we would like to do is to make the VC small, which means we want to make margin as big as possible. So, if, so if you had um, the dimensionality, a very small dimensionality, but you had a different classifier that had a very large margin, that mark, having a large margin is better than having a small dimensionality. If you have very small dimensionality, so let me just uh, I, I I don't understand your question. Uh, what I'm saying is, is what that implies is that say you have a dimensionality of five. Okay. So you see that makes it six. Okay. Then you pick some data set that has a larger dimension, a massive margin. It might actually be better to still reduce the margin. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. And in general, also this says that uh, this is another reason for starting off with a low dimensionality in the first place because. Uh, if you have low dimensionality, your VC is going to be small anyway. Because no matter what happens, your VC will never be more than this, uh, never be in this region. So that's another reason for picking the not having unnecessary feet. Okay, so in the five minutes that are left, let me uh, just revisit what we saw with margins with linear classifiers and build up on top of that uh, on Tuesday. So our goal is now to learn linear classifiers that maximize margin. And in fact, this goal is not just for linear classifiers. Uh, in general, you can try to, ex this applies more broadly. And there's a whole family of uh, learning methods that are called max margin methods that all trace their history back to this theorem. So what you're going to do now is take that this particular intuition and over a series of steps, 
construct a training objective that we are going to call the SVM objective. What that will, it will take the form of an optimization problem, a com, a com, not a combinatorial optimization, but a, a real value optimization problem, just like we saw with the regression, least mean square regression. Unlike least mean square regression, this optimization problem does not have a closed form solution, which means we need to spend some time talking about how to solve it. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page, where we are is that the first thing we know from PAC is lower VC dimension gives you better generalization. <clears throat> we also know from this theorem from Wapnick that says uh, VC dimension depends inversely on the square of the margin, okay? which means if you maximize the margin, you get lower VC dimension as a result, better generalization. That's the, the, and since there are only four minutes left now, I'm not going to get into too much of the technical detail. But I do want to kind of use this as an opportunity to remind you of this stuff so that we can start with this in the next lecture. Remember the geometry of the linear classifier. Uh, for any linear classifier, it doesn't matter which one it is. For now, let's assume that they are perfectly classifying the data set. Um, it's essentially defined by a hyperplane. The margin is the distance of the closest point to this hyperplane. So you can think of it as the absolute value of, um, let's say this point is x1 and x2. It's the absolute value of w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b divided by the norm of the weight. Or equivalently, you can think of it as y times w transpose x divided by the norm of w. So that, that way you get a positive number no matter what positive example, then y is positive, w transpose x is positive. If it's a negative example, then y is minus 1, and w transpose x is also less negative. In either case, the absolute value is exactly this quantity here. So, and that's the margin. This, you can, one way of computing the margin is you measure this distance for every example, and you find the smallest number. The other thing to keep in mind is for linear classifiers, we don't care about the actual value of W transpose X. We don't care about the actual value of, uh, for any new example, let's say let's pick this example here, we don't care about the value of the dot product of the weight and the features. All we care about is the sign. Right? And that's an important property that the SVM objective um, exploits uh, in order to uh, make the optimization problem easier to solve. And this is, let me just uh, uh, say that in a different way. Say you have this line, z plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2. If all you care about is the sign, then this line is exactly, or this particular linear classifier will give you the same decision as another linear classifier that is half of v plus half of w1 plus half of w2. In terms of what is learned, v, the vector v, w1 and w2 is obviously different from half of, or half of v, half of w1 and half of w2. Of course they are different. And in fact it is different from 1000 v, 1000 w1, 1000 w2. But all of these will give you the same decision because the only thing that matters is the sign. What that means is that we could multiply or divide these coefficients by any positive number and that doesn't change the classifier. That gives us the same classifier. And this is an important property that we will use in order to define our learning objective. I'm going to stop now but uh, I want you to think about these two properties. The first one is that the margin is the distance of the closest point. And the second one is that the actual absolute value of the dot product doesn't matter, only the sign matters. In order to define the SVM objective, we'll use these two properties in a rather clever way, I think. And uh, we come up with an optimization problem that's actually pretty easy to solve. In fact, the solution to this optimization problem will end up being an algorithm that looks 
shockingly like your perceptron algorithm. In fact, when I ask you to implement the SPM, I hope you have your perceptron code because the answer, the solution to the SPM will be about, I think, eight characters different. And that's why we have to go through all the heavy math. 